This video will uh, concentrate on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the HR diagram, and again talk about temperatures of stars, elements of star in stars, and luminosity of stars. So we might ask ourselves, why is it that different stars will have different darkness of absorption lines in their spectra, and in some cases even different wavelengths for the absorption lines in the spectra? What causes that difference? And are there any common types of stars? Any uh, situation where we would group them and a large percentage of the stars in the universe might fall in this group? So those are some of the questions that uh, we hope to answer. With very good equipment, we can take a detailed spectrum of the sun. So we're looking here at the spectrum of the sun from red to violet. And these dark lines in here are absorption lines caused by many different elements and there are different darknesses of the absorption lines in uh, a complicated analysis that we are not going to do. It's possible to unravel and determine the temperature of the solar atmosphere where these lines are produced, to determine what elements are in the solar atmosphere, and to determine the percent abundance in the solar atmosphere. Not only that, but these lines can reveal something about the density of the solar atmosphere and this was going to be applied to other stars as well. So let's go ahead and take a look here at the spectral types. The spectral types. So we have a situation here in the 1800s when people started to apply photography to astronomy and apply prisms and diffraction gratings to spread out the light. They recorded spectra, photographic spectra of the stars and then started to classify them. If you look in uh, right where my pointer is, you'll see a line that gets darker as we go from the O into the A region, and then it gets that line gets less noticeable as we go to the Gs. So the first classification of the spectral types were based on how dark the hydrogen absorption lines were. So this is the line of hydrogen, another one here, another one out in the red. So how much absorption was occurring at hydrogen? The ones where these lines were the darkest were called A, next darkest B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O. And by the O's, the hydrogen line is getting fairly dim. Um, so that was the first attempt, a classification based on the darkness of the hydrogen absorption lines. In the early 1900s, with Bohr and other uh, research into the atom, Scientists came to understand that temperature plays a big role as to whether an atom can absorb light or not. And they helped astronomers understand that their classification scheme was out of order if you were thinking this was something to do with temperature. It turns out the A stars are not the hottest stars. Instead, the O-type stars are the hottest stars. And it turns out at that temperature, hydrogen is not very able to absorb in the visual set of wavelengths. Then the B is the next hottest, A, F, G, K, and we get to the M's. And there's been some consolidation of the letters here. But uh, astronomers reorganized these spectral classes, this lettering scheme, based on information from physics. With more detailed study of the absorption lines, astronomers can make a subclass, a number, inside each letter a, from 0 to 9. So an A0 star is hotter than an A1 star, an A1 star is hotter than an A2, an A2 is hotter than an A3, so forth and so on. Uh, however, an A5 is hotter than an F0. The letter is the most important um, classification regarding temperature. And then inside a letter category, 0 through 9 gives us another refinement on the, uh, the temperature of the star. So the spectral class is over here on the left. Over on the right, these are various star catalogs where the uh, uh, star has been given a number. Uh, so I won't go into those catalogs, but there are different uh, astronomers who looked at spectra and have mapped out the sky and cataloged these, uh, these stars. So these are catalog numbers. The important thing for us is these spectral types and absorption lines. Initially, it went A through O um, based on the darkness of the absorption line of hydrogen. 
Later, after astronomers learn from physicists how the atoms work, behave under different temperature conditions, this was reorganized, and it turns out the O stars are the most uh, at the highest temperature. So, a reason for this. Here we have a hydrogen atom, a crude drawing of it, and light coming through. If the electron is in the first orbit of the hydrogen atom, visible light does not have enough energy to be absorbed and the electron make it to the second level. Visible light does not carry enough energy for absorption to occur, so the visible light will go on through. The hydrogen atom will be in this first orbit, or the electron will be in the first orbit, if the star has a very cool atmosphere. And the electron will be down here. If the star has just the right temperature, about 10,000 Kelvin in the A category, the A0s, then there's a good probability that the thermal motion in the atmosphere of the star will cause collisions energetic enough to bump the electron up to the second level. And now visible light, when it encounters an electron in the second level, does have enough energy to be absorbed and the electron will go to level 3 or level 4 or level 5 or level 6. So we need the electron to be in level 2. That is fundamental. That's key. To get absorption of visible light, the electron in the hydrogen atom has to be in level 2. And then hotter stars, uh, so we're 10,000 Kelvin here, hotter stars, 30,000 Kelvin, then we have so much thermal motion, the collisions are so frequent and so violent that the electrons are bumped up into the third energy level. One, two, three, third orbit. And in that level, again, the light that comes through here does not have the proper wavelength to be absorbed by this electron. So again, we don't get absorption lines in the visible spectrum for the very hot atmospheres where the electrons are in the atoms are up in level three. It's only the just right temperature, 10,000 Kelvin, where we get the best uh, population of electrons in level two and we get the uh, darker absorption lines in. There are more atoms with the electron in level two at this temperature, more hydrogen atoms with the electron in level two, more light gets absorbed. The absorption lines get darker. Um, then it's just a little chart here of different categories, the OBA, etc. And you should memorize this list. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. There are different mnemonics uh, for doing this. There are a couple in the reading guide that I have available for my students. And you could do a Google search for O, B, A, F, G, K, M mnemonic, and uh, you'll get several, uh, several varieties. And you could invent your own. The mnemonic is just a way of memorizing the order, making each letter be the first letter of a word, and make some uh, nonsense phrase that's memorable. But the O stars, more than 33,000 Kelvin for their temperatures. They have an overall blue cover color. Uh, they're very massive stars, more than 16 times the mass of the sun. And they're fairly large stars, more than six times the radius of the sun. Uh, and they're very luminous, a lot of energy being given off, over 30,000 times the luminosity of the sun. It's, you know, it's as in this one object, it's giving off the same energy as 30,000 suns would give off. A tremendous amount of energy. And then the hydrogen absorption lines, how strong are they? Um, and we get that uh, designation here. On the right would be how abundant is this type of star in the universe? And you can see these O stars are rare. And it's down when we get to the M stars. Those are more common. It's more common to have a small star that's not very luminous than it is to have a hot star. The Sun is a G type star. So we're in here and in our uh, category, the G category, about 8% of the stars in the universe are the G type uh, configuration okay, with the mass around the mass of the sun, etc. For, uh, for its conditions. But this is a chart that astronomers have uh, uh, produced after understanding that the absorption lines, the A absorption lines, very dark hydrogen absorption lines were because the stars at the uh, ideal temperature such that the electron would be in level two and can absorb light in the visual range. Some other examples of stars, I'm not going to go down this whole list, but uh, you know, just different examples of stars in the spectral class. You can see the luminosity is high in the O's and luminosity very small down in the M category. Um, 
the, the sun fitting in here, and you may or may not recognize some of these names. The star in Orion, Rigel, and the knee of Orion is a nice blue uh, hot star. Now, luminosity class, in terms of the Roman numeral, after the uh, uh, spectral type, after the, the letter and the number, uh, astronomers can measure the width and the shape of uh, spectral lines, and they can get an idea of how dense the atmosphere is. If the atmosphere is denser, there are more collisions between the atoms, and that somewhat distorts the energy values of the electron that are available. And it widens it and there's some other mechanisms going on as well but uh, the if we have a nice wide absorption line then this can be a class 5 Roman numeral 5 and called a dwarf and uh, it does not mean it's necessarily a small star it's just small compared to these others and there's class 4 but let's stop at class 3 we're getting a little bit less dense in the atmosphere the line gets narrower and then the supergiants the class 1 Roman numeral number 1 we have a very large star, and the outer layers are extremely thin, low density, not too many collisions between the atoms, and it turns out the absorption lines are narrower. So astronomers not only have the, uh, say, J, G2, but also the 5 after it. The G2 would be an indication of temperature. The Roman numeral is an indication of the size of the star, and we'll just deal with dwarfs, giants, and supergiants for, uh, for my class. Um, so astronomers study the absorption lines, we get an idea of what elements there, we get an idea of how abundant the elements are, we get an idea of the temperature of the star, a very good idea of the temperature of the star, and we can classify them with the letter and a number, and we also get a good idea of the density of the outer atmosphere, and can uh, classify the size of the star. This is not a measurement of the radius of the star. That comes from the eclipsing binary information. And there are starting to be some other direct techniques for measuring the, the diameter of a star. But the eclipsing binaries uh, give us this information. We can measure the diameter of the star with the eclipsing binary information. And we can then learn that the eclipsing binary stars that have very narrow absorption lines are the large ones. And in an eclipsing binary situation where the absorption lines are wide, we have a, a, a situation of smaller objects, more dense atmospheres. So that's our luminosity class. The luminosity class tells us the size of the star, at least a rough guideline for the star. Um, so the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in the early 1900s, we've got the temperature running from right to left. This deals with the B minus V situation. The B minus V, remember, is a negative number for a very hot star. So we have the negative B minus V off to the left, positive B minus V off to the right. And uh, it's been converted to temperature on, on this scale. And then luminosity, how much energy is coming off of the star. Notice some of these are tremendous values, 100,000 uh, times the luminosity of the sun. And some are very small, one thousandth the luminosity of the sun. The shaded region is called the main sequence. This sort of crosshatch region here in the main sequence. Ninety percent of the stars in the universe fall on the main sequence, lie on the main sequence. I do need to emphasize this chart is not a chart of position in the galaxy. This chart is uh, puts a star at a certain place, like Sirius B, is placed here because of its surface temperature and because of its luminosity. A spica is at this location on the chart because of its surface temperature and because of its luminosity. So we have, this is the dwarf region, the main sequence, those are the luminosity class 5 stars. Then we have the giants, Aldebaran, Arcturus would be in there, Capella, um, and we have the super giants, Betelgeuse, Deneb, and Rigel, uh, stars that are very large, the supergiant stars. On this diagram, the top right are very large stars. The bottom left are very small stars. And so the radius of the star increases as we go towards the top right. The luminosity increases as we go towards the top left. And on this main sequence, it turns out that the luminosity is governed by the mass of the star. The mass of the star controls the luminosity. <coughs> Roughly, it's uh, mass to the 3.5 power 
Um, in my class, we'll simplify that calculation a little bit, but that gives us the uh, basic behavior. Mass is the biggest influence here on the main sequence of the brightness of the star. When we get off the main sequence, the size of the star becomes important in determining its brightness. But on the main sequence, it's the mass of the star that is the primary indicator of luminosity, the primary cause of luminosity. The mass creates a certain radius and creates a certain atmospheric temperature. You know, we've studied in the past that luminosity is related to the square of the radius and the fourth power of the temperature. On the main sequence, the mass is causing a certain size star and a certain surface temperature star. Mass is the important variable, the more important parameter in controlling luminosity on the main sequence. Um, this mass luminosity relationship, this is not a linear uh, graph that's logarithmic, so don't concern yourself with that too much, but uh, this, if we would make a graph of luminosity and mass with a linear scale, this would be a very sharp curve as the mass increases, the luminosity increases greatly. So maybe just to talk about a typical star just a little bit, um, and we'll go back to the chart that had kind of the abundance. Um, so the most common stars in the galaxy, in the universe, are these red small stars. And uh, as what do you want to call typical? Do you, do you do the average of this range of quantities, or do you shift more towards uh, the K class, the M class, as being a more of a typical star? If you're just to pick a star at random, you would most likely, out of the galaxy, pick an M star. That's 76 percent of the stars. But if you're looking across the sky, you're going to see the brighter stars, these more luminous stars, stand out. And if we get back to the HR diagram, especially these supergiant stars will stand out. So when you look on the sky with your eye, uh, there's several things going on that would cause a certain star to be seen. If it's on the main sequence, its mass controls its luminosity. If it's not on the main sequence, and we'll look at the life history of a star later, uh, then the size plays an important role. So keep reading about that and ask some questions of your instructor.